since Pentecost, we've been reading the Hebrew scriptures telling us the sweeping story of King David. We followed him on his journey from being the shepherd boy with a sling to being a mighty general to finally becoming king over Israel. And this morning, John has read us the first part of the story of David's adulterous relationship with Bathsheba and of his use of his royal power to not only take another man's wife, but to see that her husband, Uriah, was killed in battle. It seems painfully obvious that David, intoxicated with the power of his office, forgot that he was subject to the same Ten Commandments that govern the rest of us. So the task of preaching this morning's text is a particularly simple one. There's really nothing complicated about it at all. When it comes to adultery and murder, don't do it. Amen. Fill in the details. You want to make sure you get your mission work. Okay. Today's scriptures really give us two radically different pictures on the use and abuse of power. In David's story, we see the truth that, of the old adage that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. But let's put David's story on hold for a minute. Actually, let's put David's story on hold for a week. We're going to get back to that with next week's scripture reading when we have the prophet who confronts David about the sin. This week, though, let's turn our attention to the reading from John's account, the story of the crowds following Jesus and the disciples looking out and seeing so many hungry people that it would take six months' wages to feed them all. Jesus looks at his disciples and tells them, you guys take care of it. Now, if you're anything like me, that you guys take care of it command is exactly the wrong thing. It's not what we want to hear. We want to hear Jesus say, I got this. Right? We, we want Jesus to step up and tell his disciples, don't worry about a thing. But he doesn't. You guys take care of it. And the disciples tear their hair. Philip, who is the quartermaster for the Jesus crew, has no idea what to do. But Simon Peter, in his typical fashion, announces a simple solution. He has found a boy who has five loaves and two fish. Five loaves, two fish. Do the math. It, it, it's not going to be pretty. We're going to have people fighting over the tail fins. We're going to have every crumb of bread being contested. We're going to have people who are angry that somebody got a mouthful of gill. <laughs> and they didn't get any. Five loaves, two fishes. This is not going to work out. But somehow Jesus manages to pull off a major coup. With five loaves and two fish, he feeds everyone. And then collects twelve baskets full of leftovers. You know, preachers have been wrestling with this text for, well, as long as it's been a text. On the one hand, we want Jesus to have performed a miracle, but the text doesn't tell us that he did. It just says that everyone got fed. On the other hand, we start looking for ways to understand what might have happened 
that makes sense. I mean, maybe that boy bringing forth his lunch and giving it to Simon Peter, who then gave it to Jesus, had everyone else watching and thinking, oh, well, if he's going to share his lunch, maybe I should share mine, too. You know, it's the same thing that happens in churches when there's a fund drive and someone says, I will offer a matching gift. Right? You know, now that there's somebody who is stepping forward and saying, I will pony up, other people do too. But the text doesn't tell us what happened. And we're left to try and understand, we're left to try and interpret it for ourselves. K.H. Ting, who is principal of the Nanjing Theological Seminary, took a unique and decidedly Chinese tack when he preached this text, explaining that since it was Christ who gave the instructions for the people to be seated in orderly groups, perhaps we could hear the words of Jesus and Understand that he wasn't curtailing people's freedoms, but instead he was organizing them. I said it was a uniquely Chinese take. And so Ting preaches that this is a text about organizing the people for efficiency. Of course, maybe that wasn't it either. We can't know what happened. We can guess. But you know, even that guessing leaves us with some pretty impressive happenings on that day. Because however Jesus managed to feed the people, whether it was by doing a miracle and transforming five loaves and two fish into enough food to feed thousands, or whether it was using organization to get the people to sit down and, well, these clearly weren't congregationalists, were they? Or maybe if the miracle was the miracle of getting people to share what they already had, the people recognized that something special had just happened. And they came to Jesus, not just to thank him for feeding them, but to take him and by force make him be king. It's not that often that people are forced to become king. It's the kind of thing usually people jockey to become king. They work to become king. They assassinate other people in order to become king. This may have been the only time in the history of the world that someone has had the crowd come to make them king and then turned their back. Jesus walked away from the accolades of the crowd. He ducked the offer of power that was being made to him. As unlikely as it seems, the man that we call the Son of God, the man that we call the King of Kings, avoided the crowd that would make him king. He disappears. He slips away and he isn't seen again. And so the disciples, completely bum-fuzzled, it's a good southernism, the completely bum-fuzzled disciples who can't find Jesus get into a boat and start rowing across the Sea of Galilee. After all, they had just crossed back and forth a couple times. Maybe Jesus is going to turn up on the other side. Who knows? But clearly he isn't there with them. And as they row, the wind kicks up. Their little boat is swamped. And then they see, walking across the way, <coughs> the figure of man coming inexorably towards them. Now, I don't know about you, but I've never seen anyone walking across the water in the middle of a storm. I've never seen anyone walking across the water, not in the middle of a storm, for that matter. But the disciples looking out and seeing this were just as blown away as any of us might be. Their minds began racing. 
What could this be? Who could this be coming across the waves towards them? They were terrified, thinking that it must have been a ghost. Until finally, just before they can make out his voice, they, they see his face. They recognize him, and then the wind shifts, and they suddenly can hear as he cries out, Hey guys, don't worry! It's me, Jesus! And they all breathe a sigh of relief. They wait for Jesus to catch up with them. And as he steps into the boat, the bow grinds against the sand at the opposite shore. Once again, they have reached their destination. And John doesn't bother to tell us whether it's because they were already there or if the presence of Jesus in their boat hurried them across in a miraculous fashion. What are we to make, though, of this Jesus who organizes the people into companies and feeds them and refuses to be king? What are we to make of this Jesus who sneaks off to a mountain hideout that is next seen striding across the waters in the midst of the storm. He is the power of the king. The title is his for the taking. The people have recognized who he is and are willing to follow him. But he refuses the power when it's offered. Unlike David, who had become king and used the title and the authority to command life and death. Jesus, who could command life and death, chose to give bread and fish to a hungry crowd. He chose to rescue those who were in the boat, afraid of drowning. It was, in fact, through Jesus' refusal of power that he was able to continue providing the needs of the people and even offering himself to become the bread of life. You know, there's a lesson for us here. So often in our lives we look at the powerful, those whose names are on the nightly news, those who can call together business leaders and those in charge of government. We see their stories, we think, if only we had power like that, maybe we could make a difference. But we don't. At least I'm not aware of anybody here who does. We are instead a simple people. We all have those areas where we can make some difference, sure, but none of us are in line for the next presidential nomination, I don't think. Anybody? Because, you know, our current president is a UCC member. So just in case we've forgotten that one. But, but every so often, we, we find ourselves despairing that we lack power, that we lack the ability to do things. But Jesus, when off of the power, let go. Because his ability, which happens to be our ability as the body of Christ, is the ability to feed the hungry. We were talking about the miracle of uh, miraculous hot dogs. <laughs> right? Yes. You know, how are we going to feed all these people? And somebody shows up with extras. It's a simple miracle. It's the miracle of the Appalachia Service Project where people go down with a hammer and some nails and transform lives. It's the miracle of being a church right here in the corner that everybody drives by and sees. And some stop in to find their lives changed. It's the miracle of a thrift shop 
where some days everything's half price. <laughs> <laughs> and if you ask me, half price stuff at a thrift shop is a miracle. <laughs> but our miracle comes from service. Our miracle doesn't come from power. We don't come here because it's the politically expedient thing to do. Though I know many of us remember a day when church membership was required to be a fine, upstanding person in the community. You had to be a member of a church just like you had to be a member of the Chamber of Commerce and three or four other societies named after animals. But that's not the case anymore. In our society, church membership is optional. And so we don't come here for the power. And I know that we have plenty of reasons to lament the change of our society, but you know, if we're here because we want to be, if we're here because this is where we encounter the Jesus who feeds us and equips us to feed others, isn't that better than being here because it connects us with the right people? I think it is. So we come together today as family, coming and going from our summer vacations, coming and going from our mission work, coming and going from our busy lives, and we encounter Christ, feeding us with bread and fish, with bread and wine, with body and spirit. We come together and encounter Christ, feeding us body and soul, sharing our community, and yes, feeding us with lemonade and cookies. And that's the gift. The gift of being loved, of being cared for, and of being empowered. Thanks be to God, who meets us here in the face of Jesus Christ and in the face of sisters and brothers. Thanks be to God, who is with us now, here and every day, wherever we find ourselves.